Hello Year 11. Welcome to the Animal Farm Revision Session Group and this is the place where you will be revising the characters, the themes, looking at past questions and learning how to write essays. What we're going to be needing first of all is a pen and paper. If you choose not to do that, can you just open yourself a Google Doc please and that's where you'll be writing all your notes from this session. Right, let's get started then. As it's been such a long time since we read this book, we're going to return right back to basics, so please don't feel concerned if you can't remember the names of characters and the order of events. We'll be covering that this week and next. So, this week we're going to be looking at the context of the, top of the book and we're going to be looking at the plot. You'll be asked to do lots of core knowledge quizzes, you'll be rereading the book and then you'll be plotting the key events of the book as you listen to it. You have one week to complete the quizzes and you have two weeks to complete the reading. The reading should take you three hours. But what I've organised, if you have a look on Google Classroom, is for you to listen to the book as you're doing your notes. So I think that probably will help you. Now context is one of the areas in which you will be assessed when you do your piece of writing on this. AO3, assessment objective number three, asks you to comment on the thoughts and feelings that people had at the time that the book was written and the book was set. Now, the book was written in 1944, just before the end of World War II, and the book is set somewhere between the period of 1917 to 1945 and covers the period of the Russian Revolution, although a specific date is not actually given in the novel. Now if we look at the thoughts and feelings people had at the time, cast your eyes to the right hand side of the screen, you'll see in bold that people had these general feelings. The first is a fear of totalitarianism. If you are a totalitarian leader, it means you rule alone and you have total power. Can you see the word total is in the word? This person had the right to make decisions about every small detail of ordinary everyday people's lives, how much they ate, where they lived, the food that they produced, the work that they did. There was anger at the time as well at the forgotten working man. This leader was ruling for their own greed and their own sense of power, but didn't cater for the needs of the working man. Therefore, starvation was quite common in this period of 1945. The world was weary at this stage because they'd just had six years of war and they just couldn't see the end of it. One minute, the British and the Allies were winning World War II, another minute, it was the Germans, so it was a long power struggle and people were just tired of it and longed for peace. And finally, they were proud of their country and you'll see lots of poems written, particularly in the first half of World War II and World War I, where people were in praise of their country. They loved England and England's green lands. So you'll see a lot of those feelings come through the Book of Animal Farm too. Now it's really helpful if we understand what's going on in the world at the time that a book was written. We've already said it was written in 1944 and as you can see from the top bullet point here that the events in Russia that caused the revolution in 1917, October of that year, had an impact all the way up to 1945 and beyond to 1953 when Stalin died. In 1917, there was a Russian revolution. The Bolsheviks were absolutely fed up with the power that had been invested in the Tsar. Now, a Tsar is just another word for a king. And the Tsar and the Tsarina lived a protected life where they were rolling in wealth, yet all the people around them were seriously struggling with everyday things such as finding enough food to eat, having shelter and keeping warm from the cold Russian winters. As a result of that, Lenin, and several of his friends, Trotsky being one of them, came together to rise up. They overthrew the Tsar. In fact, they assassinated the whole royal family and they took over power, being one of equals. So the idea was that everybody ran in a community, in a communal way, and therefore communism means that everybody was equal, all working together. Everybody was paid the same and everybody was treated the same. And this worked incredibly well until Stalin came around. And we can see that Stalin was a leader who came in the 1930s and he became a dictator, a totalitarian dictator. And you will read from your history books and from your class notes how he was in complete control. And everybody who lived and worked under him in Russia 
were struggling and they suffered. It was this that really made George Orwell angry and worried because he wanted to set a moral tale to explain to everybody the dangers of people who begin to rule as if they're equal to everybody else but then become so obsessed and controlled by power that they end up becoming corrupted by power and that is what totalitarian leaders are. Okay, So we've explained that by the time all of this had happened in the 1917 all the way up to the 1930s Towards the end of World War II, which took place between 1939 and 1945, people were genuinely afraid that totalitarianism would come to this country. And so for that reason, George Orwell decided that he was going to write this book of Animal Farm. He wrote it as a fairy tale so that it could be accessible to lots of different people. And he wrote it on a farm in England so that his audience could understand that actually totalitarianism isn't just something that happens in Nazi Germany or Mussolini's Italy or Stalinist Russia. It can also happen in this country. And there was a big fascist movement that was veering towards communism. There was a fear at that time. The other thing that affected George Orwell and had a strong influence over his writing was the Spanish Civil War. And he went over to Spain to fight in that civil war. And while he was there, between 1936 and 1939, he got to know the ordinary everyday man, the working man. And he gained a lot of sympathy for the needs of that particular group of people. He realised that they were rejected and ignored by these totalitarian leaders who only seemed to want to own power for their own wealth and for their own um, strength. And... As a result of that, he became absolutely furious, incensed even, that these ordinary everyday people were simply being ignored. And for that reason, he decided he was going to write a book about the plight of the working man. And you can see this through the character of Boxer, where he shares the most sympathy. In addition to that, as a young boy, Orwell was walking along the street in England one day by a farm and he saw a stable lad repeatedly hitting a horse and he saw the horse neighing and whinnying in distress but it couldn't answer back and it couldn't fight back and it became defenceless and for our writer George Orwell he saw that symbol as a metaphor for the working man who was constantly beaten who was forced into starvation who was forced to work and never gain anything for himself so he actually saw a strong link between the abuse that people show horses and the abuse that people show other people treating them as if they were animals. And that really is what solidified his decision to make a book about the Russian Revolution and the fear of communism turning into totalitarianism into a modern fable, a fairy tale about a farm in England that looks at the plight of the working man through animals. Right then. You've heard my information burst on context. Every time you see this Pac-Man symbol, it means that you are going to be tested or quizzed on the information that you've just learned. Okay, so what you're going to do at this stage is to pause this video, you'll go onto Google Classroom and you're going to complete the first of your quizzes. This one is called Context of Animal Farm. Feel free, of course, to pause or rewind or listen to this video as you're completing it. The aim is for you to get 10 out of 10 to show a clear understanding. Once you've submitted your quiz, you'll then be able to move on to the next slide. Okay, Year 11, we've completed stage one of the revision by looking at the context in which the novel is set. Our next step now is to look at the story. So can you write down the subheading of plot, please? And the first thing we're going to look at is the structure of the story. George Orwell is the author. He was a British writer and he was a democratic socialist. And democratic socialists believe that we should have a socially owned economy. So that means the state owns all the businesses that work within a country. But where he wanted this to be different from the totalitarian system he saw emerging in Europe, he found that it would be much better to have an emphasis on democracy in the workplace. So in essence, what that meant was that everybody who works in a factory or an organisation should have a right on the way that it is run. And they should also have a share in the value and the profits that are generated from that business. The narrator of the story has been deliberately chosen to be the third person omniscient. Now, you may not have heard of that word omniscient 
before. It means all knowing. And if you look at those last few letters of the word omniscient, S-C-I-E-N, it should actually remind you of one of the subjects that you complete. And science means knowledge. And you know that because you have lots of core knowledge tests in that subject. So when we look at a narrator who is the third person, we know that he or she uses words like he, she, they, it, and names of characters. Omni means all, so we know that this person can see all. And seant, we now know, means knowledge. It means they know everything as well. So the benefit of using this kind of narrator is that you and I, the reader, see everything at the same time as the narrator sees it. And we are even allowed to zoom into an inside focus to look at the character's thoughts. So when we look at the structure here, we mean the outside focus. What are the characters doing? How do they relate to one another? What are their actions? And we're look at looking at the inside focus. So what makes that character tick? What are they thinking? What are they feeling? What are their reactions to the events that take place? OK, remember that because there's going to be a quiz on that a little bit later. Now, we've already talked about George Orwell writing this book as a fable. But to be very clear on what a fable is, it's a fairy tale. And so it's accessible to everybody, but it has a moral at the ending. So when we look at the beginning and the endings and we compare those two things, I'd like to think more closely about that. What are we as a reader actually learning at the end of this novel? This story is also an allegory. What an allegory is, it's a story on the surface level, but when you look deeper, this story is actually representing a real life story beneath it. I'll give you an example. When you're in year seven, you looked at the book, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe from the Narnia series. Well, that story was also an allegory. And this allegory told the story of Jesus Christ coming to the world and saving people. And that was represented through the character of Aslan, who came to the world and as a sacrifice, allowed other people to live and be free. So you've come across these allegories before. What they do is they engage a wide audience because some people would just learn morals from the surface meaning. But they also encourage people like you and me, students of the book, to study the book deeper and realise that there are lots of parallels. And of course, the parallels in this novel are with the Russian Revolution that occurred in October 1917, all the way up to the time period where this book was written, 1944 at a time when Stalin was still very much in full flow. Because remember, Stalin didn't leave power and the totalitarian and dictatorship didn't end until 1953 at the point of his death. The last thing we need to be thinking about here is the cyclical structure. And if you look at that word cyclical, again, it looks like a cycle, doesn't it? And when you have a cycle, things go round and round. What goes comes around, it returns. And at the beginning of the play, of the novel rather, we see that this place is called Manor Farm. The rebellion takes place. The animals name it for themselves, calling it Animal Farm. And at the end, it returns to Manor Farm. So you could actually use that as a metaphor to be able to show that no matter what these creatures do, they're always going to be returning to some sort of totalitarian dictatorship. It's rather a cynical view, but it's what George Orwell felt about totalitarianism across Europe at the time. In the same way as before, you're going to stop this video, complete the second quiz. This one is called The Structure of Animal Farm. Again, you can use the video to help you. Your aim is to get 10 out of 10. Once you've submitted it, then you can go on to the next slide. Sometimes, when it's been a long time since you've read a book, I think it's quite helpful to be able to hear the story in an overview. So I'm going to read you the story now in its abbreviated form, so you'll hear the nutshell of what this book is all about. OK? So the story starts on Manor Farm, which is run by Mr Jones the farmer. And one of the pigs, Old Major, has had a dream, and all the animals gather around to hear all about it. And he's dreamt of a world where all animals live free and aren't worked so hard by their owners. Now, Old Major also introduces a song which he remembered from his childhood and it gives the animals hope. This song is called The Beast of England and later in the story it's established as the anthem for animalism, their new way of living their lives without the tyranny of man. Now, Old Major dies after the meeting, but the animals, who've been inspired by Old Major's philosophy of animalism, plot a rebellion against Jones. 
Mr Jones is the owner of the farm and he maltreats the animals. Two of the pigs, Snowball and Napoleon, help to plan and carry out the successful rebellion and here Jones and his men are chased off the farm by the animals and Manor Farm is renamed by the animals as Animal Farm. So this is the beginning of communism. In the book it's known as animalism. The animals create the seven commandments which are a set of rules that they vow to live by and these include whatever goes upon two legs is an enemy and no animal shall kill any other animal. Now initially the rebellion is a success. The animals complete the harvest in record time and they have a meeting every Sunday to discuss and debate how to live on the farm. So this is a form of democracy because all the animals have a say in the way that the farm is run. It soon becomes clear however that the pigs are the most intelligent creatures and as a result become the leaders of the farm. Napoleon is a very power hungry pig however and he steals the cow's milk and a number of apples to feed himself and the other pigs. Now he enlists the help of Squealer and he's a pig who has the ability to persuade the other animals that the pigs are always moral and correct in their decisions. And there's a well-known phrase for Squealer, he was so good at persuasion that he was able to, quote, turn black into white. That's quite a useful quote to remember. Now after a few months, Jones and his men return to Animal Farm and they attempt to retake it. Thanks to the tactics of Snowball though, the animals defeat Jones in what's known as the Battle of the Cowshed. Snowball decides the animals need a windmill to help them with food production and so he draws up plans for a windmill which will provide electricity and therefore give the animals more leisure time. Napoleon opposes the plans and he actually quote urinated over the plans to show his disdain and his disgust. If you remember we uncovered that one in class. And as a result of that the plans go to a vote. Now on the day of the vote, Napoleon summons a pack of ferocious dogs whom he has stolen from Jesse when they were just pups and he's trained them to be like the SS in Nazi Germany. So he, they become his secret police if you like and they are so feared by the other animals that they easily chase Snowball off the farm forever. Gone. Now we only have one totalitarian leader. His name is Napoleon. So Napoleon announces that the windmill, which was Snowball's idea, will be built after all, and in fact it was his idea. He says that it was his own idea and he steals it from Snowball. Now for the rest of the novel, Snowball uses, um, is used as a scapegoat on whom Napoleon blames all the animals' hardships and people tend to fear him, thinking he's coming to undermine the farm's effort and he's come to steal the grain and the resources they produce. Eventually the animals start to rebuild the windmill and Boxer, an incredibly strong horse, works harder than anyone else. He even gets up earlier, he does double shifts and his whole motto is, here's another quote for you, I will work harder. Now Napoleon gradually takes all the power away from the, all the other animals and he becomes a dictator. Despite what the commandment said, the pigs start to live in the farmhouse. The animals receive less and less food while the pigs grow fatter and as more of the seven commandments of animalism are broken by the pigs the language of the commandments is conveniently changed. For example after the pigs become drunk one night the commandment no animal shall drink alcohol is changed to no animal shall drink alcohol to excess. After this things go from bad to worse. And in order to try and keep the farm afloat, Napoleon finds himself dealing with the other farmers. And as a result of that, trade is established, therefore breaking yet another one of the commandments. Now, everything comes to a head when animals are asked to accuse other animals of committing crimes. This creates a sense of fear and anxiety. And of course, you can probably guess the secret police, those pack of ferocious dogs, are brought in and they actually maul and execute those creatures. So the result of that is incredible fear afterwards and there's a lot of dramatic changes from this point on in the story. Beast of England is abandoned, the Seven Commandments are changed beyond recognition, a new character is introduced, Minimus, who declares absolute devotion and loyalty so that Napoleon is always right which is a nod back to the times of Stalin being always right in Stalinist Russia. 
The windmill is built eventually, but it's more or less built on the bones of poor old Boxer. The farmers in the area are determined that they're going to take over the farm, and so by sly underhand means, one evening they come into the farm, they use explosives and they blow up the windmill. Undeterred, Boxer decides he's going to rebuild it block by block, but because he's had years of intense labour now, he no longer has the strength, and poor Boxer gradually, slowly dies after an injury. He's sent off to the knacker's yard, which is a place where his bones will be boiled down to glue and all the other animals are screaming and shouting at him to get out of the box and the last thing we hear of Boxer is the furious cries and the banging and hammering of his hooves he's tried to get out but of course Boxer doesn't have the strength and therefore dies soon after. Now the manipulation continues when the ever powerful squealer announces to everybody that Boxer hasn't gone to the knacker's yard instead he's just gone to a place of retirement but by this stage, very few people believe the pigs. The ultimate conclusion comes when the pigs meet up with the farmers. They're drinking alcohol in the house, playing cards. And Napoleon and Frederick are cheating one another and they sound alike, they look alike, and all the other animals are seen from the outside perspective just looking in. And the shot comes when rather strangely and in a wobbly way, we can see Squealer walking on his hind legs. It's at that point that the animals look from man to beast to beast to man and they realise that they are in fact indistinguishable. The final declaration, as Napoleon stands in one of his rare speeches, he declares that Animal Farm shall be restored to its original name of Manor Farm. And actually the ending is meant to suggest that even though these animals have had a great experimentation, ultimately, if you have a group of people in the name of equality who come to power, power controls them and they become a dictator in the same way as a person they were trying to remove. If we look at the allegorical meaning of this, Stalin acts just as much as a controller as the Tsar Nicholas II did in 1917. So after all those years, 1917 to about 1944, 1945, when the novel is set, everybody returns back to type. So it goes back to the normal position they're in at the beginning of the novel. Right, so you should have an overview of the story now, and hopefully parts of it are beginning to sound familiar. To fill yourself in even further, of course, you have the homework to listen to the story again and fill in the plot tracker. Go to Google Classroom, all the information is there. And also, you made lots of notes in your exercise book from last year, so if you dig that out, you'll be able to read up in more detail. So you're about to pause this video and complete the third task on Google Classroom now. It's called Know the Order of Events. When you see the sheet you have in front of you here, there'll be a duplicate waiting for you there, and all you need to do is to put all of these events into the correct order from your understanding of what you have just heard. When you've done that, you're going to upload it. And then when you've done that, you're going to take each one of these and you're going to put them on a post-it and put them as if they're in a timeline by your bedroom wall. And the aim is for you to revise them, learn them off by heart and see how many you can get in the right order night after night. And that will help you to have a clear understanding of where the story is going. Take a photo of it when it's done. You can also upload that onto Google Classroom. Right, so now that we've looked at the events, we know what's happening in the story and the order in which they happen, we're going to look a bit closer now. So what I'd like you to do is to look at the 10 you've written down, double check they are right please with the answers that have been sent to you. And then I'd like you to rank the events not in the order in which they occur, so not chronologically, this time in the order of importance. Which event would you put at the top as having the most impact and makes the animals change their thinking or perhaps their actions, which perhaps causes a chain of events and leads to another event? Which one would you place at the top and which event would you say was the least important and which one would you put slap bang in the middle? Once you've got your beginning, middle and end structure, you'll then be able to filter all the other events in at places you think are most appropriate. Okay, so let's just have a little practice of that. If we looked at um, Old Major's speech, for example, it happens right at the beginning of the story. It happens just before the animals are maltreated yet again and Jones comes out with his gun. 
why is that really significant? Would that really be the first thing that you put at the top? Well, on the one hand, yes, it's very significant because Old Major provides hope for the animals and it encourages them to think about life in a different way to the one they've been enduring. They realise they don't have to accept the maltreatment and they themselves are the agency of change. They have the power to make things different. So that's quite a significant moment. As a result of that, the animals get to hear Beast of England for the first time. And as a result of that, it gives them hope. It makes them think about a shared identity. That then enables them to think about animalism, which promotes them to then rebel against the humans, which then makes them realise that they can do things for themselves. Can you see that is quite a significant event, isn't it? Um, if we take the one of the, um, I don't know, you could take anyone, I suppose, if we talk about Boxer's collapse, for example, when he's killed, is that more significant than Old Major's speech, or do you think it's just as significant? It certainly brings pathos, doesn't it, because we realise that this horse has been worked and overworked, and he's just been relied upon for his strength but hasn't actually been fed more, he hasn't been given more rest, the pigs don't seem to value him any more than the others, they allow him to go early and late and extend his hours, and as a result of that, Boxer realises that he just can't do it on his own, his weakness occurs in his joints, he has the injury, and then he's sent away to the knacker's yard. So that could be quite a powerful symbol of the corruption and the lack of care that leaders have for their workers, which of course George Orwell felt incredibly strongly about as a social democrat. So you might want to put that one as being more important than Old Major or less. So what you'll have to do is evaluate the worth of each of those events and then when you're happy, put them in an order in which you think you could explain. So just jot down your explanation, probably two or three sentences at the bottom, why have you chosen that order? And then when you've done that, you're going to take the three most symbolic moments. So not necessarily the events that have happened, but what they do and how they make other people act as a reaction to these events. Okay, have a play around with that. It should take you about 20 minutes to do that if you're thinking through carefully. All right, so let's just backtrack a little bit on what we've done so far. We've looked at the context of the story and we know a little bit more about the thoughts and feelings of George Orwell and what inspired him to write the book. We've also looked at the story itself, so we know the plot and the events and we've been thinking about the significance of those events, why they're important and what order we would prefer them to go in and therefore we've started to give our own personal critical views. So those feelings and opinions that you put into place in the previous task will come in very handy when you need to start writing essays. So what we're going to do now is play around with the events and look at the connections between them. So I've started to devise here a train line and I imagine some of you have now been on the London Underground and you'll notice that all of these lines are different colours yet they connect with one another. So what you're going to do is after I've explained this task you're going to go into Google Classroom you'll find this sheet already there waiting for you and you're going to be looking at the task of making connections between the events. Why did one happen? Why did it cause the other to happen? So just listen to my walkthrough and then you're going to see if you can add any events yourself or develop further reasons and explanations. You'll be able to write that on lined up or paper and upload it by taking a photograph or otherwise you can just add a separate page and then you can type your analysis into the Word document, okay? So here's the first view then, we're looking at Old Major's speech. Now from the previous reasons I gave, Old Major's speech is significant because it provides hope for the animals and they realise that they can cause their own rebellion. When you rebel against something it means you completely disregard what's happened already, you make a change and you make a new future for yourself and in this case for the animals on the farm. Now that rebellion brings about the thoughts and feelings that Old Major had in his original dream and that's known as animalism and animalism brings with them the seven commandments it brings them independence they learn how to work the farm for themselves snowball is instrumental because he starts reading around and realizes that education is important so he starts training the other animals to learn the alphabet and to read some are more successful than others so we can see lots of hope for the future we can see everything's working fine We've got a community, it's very different to the one that's there already established. 
However, animalism doesn't seem to be successful entirely on its own. And Napoleon soon realises that he has to reach out to the other farmers in order to engage in trade. Now he has to engage in trade because he realises that no man is an island, no farm works independently, it's got to work with its neighbours. And this is a reference to Stalin's attempt to work with Britain and America. So there are secret trading um, facilities going on, even though the West were absolutely disparaging. That means they turned their nose up and they hated the idea of communism being successful. Okay, So animalism worked independently. That meant because it couldn't entirely work independently, they had to trade. The trade meant they became more like humans. And at the end, the two were indistinguishable, pigs walking on hind legs, laughing before and drinking alcohol in exactly the same way as the other farmers. And that, of course, led to the failure of the experiment. So can you see the connections and links are there? You've just got to find them. Now, I suggest that if you need any further help, you go on to BBC Bite Size because that has got an excellent timeline and it can explain things to you in more detail. OK, go to Google Classroom and add your own ideas now. So overall this week, we've been examining the context of the Russian Revolution and other events such as World War II and the Spanish Civil War, which had an impact on this story. We've explored the plot, we've heard a brief version of it, and then you're continuing to listen to it on YouTube and fill in the plot tracker on Google Classroom. You've looked at the worth of each of those events and your evaluation skills have enabled you to put them in a rank order and choose the three most significant. And finally, you've been making links between those events so that you can start to think about your own understanding and develop a personal and critical voice. Congratulations on the hard work you've done this week. I look forward very much to seeing what you have written. So please continue to upload your work on Google Classroom. Next week, we're going to be looking at character.